two seconds for everybody to just come in and settle down before we, we start. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us here this evening at our annual Steve Biko uh, lecture. Um, and also to our colleagues online, um, there are quite a number of people also joining us online. Um, I'm going to just hand over to our Dean of the Faculty, Prof. Shabir Madi, who I'm sure many of you do know, um, given his many appearances on television, as I joke when I do see him. So I'm just going to hand over to him, and he will introduce our speaker for tonight. Um, at the end, I'll be available also for Q&A. So those of you who are online, uh, you should have a, a feature there that allows you to post your questions, and at the end, um, we'll fill those. Thank you. Uh, thanks, and good evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, so my name is Shubhi Mahdi, as has been mentioned, and I started as dean on the 1st of uh, January 2021, having succeeded Prof. Martin Bello sitting at the back. But perhaps just to give a little background as to why we've ended up inviting Krista Kuljan to this to give this uh, talk, the Steve Biko Bioethics Annual Lecture Talk. And this is obviously on the 51st anniversary of the passing of Steve Biko. So a few months back, I received a call from Prof. Joe Bariava, who unfortunately is not too well and might have joined us uh, online. And welcome to those 250, 60 guests that have also joined us on, online. Uh, I was a bit skeptical about having a hybrid function, but clearly uh, people are really keen to hear what you've got to say. Uh, in any case, uh, I received this phone call from Prof. Joe Bodeava, and he asked me, have you read this book on Darwin's hunch? i really excited about it. And I said, yes, I did read it. In fact, I was privileged enough to be gifted this book a few I think it was around about 2021, uh, in the middle of COVID-19 by Krista, who I know socially. And it was one of those books which was absolutely mind-blowing. Uh, mind-blowing in that we thought that we understood what was the role of birds and scientists in paleoanthropology. Uh, many of these scientists are highly regarded uh, globally, not just nationally, but what was being unmasked in this book was something which even someone such as Prof. Joe Vriava, who's been at this institute for more than 50 years, and was very much instrumental in terms of understanding the role in relation to apartheid and apartheid policies and unpacking that. And even to him, it was completely news as to what Krista was unmasking in this book. So a really fascinating book. And one of the few books which I simply couldn't put away, uh, despite being overwhelmed with needing to keep up with the literature on COVID-19, uh, this particular book really outcompeted me keeping in touch with COVID-19. Uh, so a, a truly remarkable book. So just briefly to introduce Krista. So Krista is, uh, Krista Gultuljian is a science writer and author of two books, The Sanctuary and Darwin Sanch, Science Race and the Search for Human Origins. Uh, Krista studied for a BA in History of Sciences at Harvard in and completed in 1984, which provided the inspiration for Darwin Sanch. Darwin Sancho was shortlisted for the Sunday Times Ellen Patton Award for Nonfiction in 2017 and the Humanities and Social Science Nonfiction Award in 2018. In 2010, Krista delivered the Ruth's first lecture about the crisis of migration and xenophobia at, at the Central Methodist Church in downtown Johannesburg, which led to her first book, Sanctuary. Currently a research associate at the Wits Institute for Social and Economic Research, WISER, she will publish a third book about the network of women scientists in the Boston area who contributed to feminist and anti-racist critiques of science in the 1970s and 1980s. In the 1980s, Krista also volunteered for the South African Council of Churches in Johannesburg and worked as a foreign policy aide for Senator Edward Kennedy in Washington, DC, focusing on human rights abuses in Southern and in human rights abuses in Southern Africa and promoting the Comprehensive Anti-Apartheid Act of 1986. 
From 1992 to 2003, she was a director of the CS Mott Foundation in South Africa with a focus on human rights, paralegal and advice officers, women's organizations, and strengthening community-based organizations and the NGO sector. In addition to a BA, she also holds a master's in public affairs from Princeton and an MA in writing from the University of the Witwatersrand. So Krista, thank you for having accepted this invite and really look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone here and at home. I hope you heard that that last degree was from Vitz. <laughs> um, thank you very much to Joe Variava, to Shabir Mahdi, to Ames Dye, to Kevin Behrens um, for inviting me tonight. When I studied the history of science in the 1980s, several of my professors, including Harvard paleontologist Stephen Jay Gould and biologist Ruth Hubbard, emphasized that science does not exist in a vacuum. Scientists and their research are often shaped by their social and political context. When I started writing about the history of the search for human origins, I asked, what impact did colonialism have on scientists studying human evolution in the early 20th century? What influence did apartheid have on that search? A large portion of my talk today is based on the research I did for this book, Darwin's Hunch, Science, Race, and the Search for Human Origins. Charles Darwin wrote in 1871 in The Descent of Man that it was likely that all humans on earth had common origins in Africa. His theory, Darwin's hunch, was not widely accepted at the time. Most of his peers rejected that theory, an assumption, um, sorry, rejected that theory and believed that humans had evolved in Europe or perhaps Asia. That thinking came from the assumption at the time that white Europeans were superior to other peoples around the world and that there was a hierarchy of race. Colonial thinking infused many fields at the time, including paleoanthropology. Based on a fossil find in 1912 called Piltdown Man, paleontologists excitedly and wrongly declared that humans had their origins in Sussex, England. <laughs> the lecture is in four parts. The first on the history of comparative anatomy and race typology, covering Raymond Dart and Philip Tobias. The second part on the impact of Steve Biko's death on medical ethics. A third on post-apartheid shifts and finally, where to from here, Vitz for good. This is a young Raymond Dart from Australia. Dart was educated there and in the UK before he moved to South Africa in 1922. He came to Johannesburg as the head of the Department of Anatomy at Vitz University. Most people know of Raymond Dart because in February 1925, he described the Taung child skull, which he's holding in this photo, a famous fossil found in South Africa. Writing for Nature, he named it Australopithecus africanus, meaning Southern Ape of Africa, and argued that humans had origins in Africa. Just as Darwin was rejected, Dart's idea was rejected by many other scientists, especially with their belief in Piltdown Man. It would take decades for Dart to be proven correct. What I found in my years of research for this book in many archives is that for more than two centuries in this field, scientists viewed black people as specimens, not as human beings. The field of paleoanthropology, and I would argue the fields of anatomy and medical science, 
are built on foundations of racist science and white supremacy, which has bearing on bioethics today. I must warn everyone in the audience and those joining us online that for some people, the stories I am going to tell will be upsetting. For others, they will be shocking. And for many, these stories will make you very angry. To start with, let's go back all the way to Linnaeus, the Swedish botanist in the mid 1700s who first named humans as Homo sapiens. He decided, um, or he divided us into four variations defined largely by geography and physical appearance. What a lot of people don't realize is that he created a fifth group called Homo monstrosus, which included what he called monstrous or abnormal people. And he put the Khoi and the San people of Southern Africa in this category. This naming was powerful and dehumanizing. Linnaeus sent a painful ripple effect across the centuries. Over a hundred years later, when Charles Darwin published The Descent of Man, Linnaeus's naming continued to have influence. At the same time, it had an impact on Robert Broom, a Scottish medical doctor and paleontologist who arrived in South Africa in the late 1800s and declared the most interesting specimens were the natives. Many universities in Europe, as well, as museums and universities in the US had begun collecting human skeletons and the international skeleton trade was brisk. In a letter to Lawrence Wells, Broom described his work in 1897. I cut their heads off and boiled them in paraffin tins on the kitchen stove and sent them to Turner. William Turner was at the University of Edinburgh White supremacy had taken hold in science around the world. What many people don't know about Raymond Dart is that when he arrived in South Africa, he started a human skeleton collection. He had seen these collections in Europe and the UK, and he was especially impressed with the Terry human skeleton collection in St. Louis in the US. The motivation for starting these collections was to understand comparative anatomy and race. In the US, the anatomists looked especially at the skeletons of people indigenous to the Americas. What you're looking at here is the Dart Human Skeleton Collection in 1960. In addition to full skeletons, there are human skulls on the shelves. Scientists at the time thought that humans could be divided into separate and distinct and pure racial types. They thought these pure racial types, which we know now do not exist, would give them insight into human evolution. Dart believed in race typolo typology that classified humans by their physical characteristics was an important aspect of physical anthropology. He was particularly interested in the anatomy of the people of Southern Africa, especially the San and the Khoi. He hoped that understanding their anatomy would give him a clue to understand race typology and human evolution. In 1936, Dart led a Witz expedition of scientists to the Kalahari. The Witz scientists conducted their research in the stylized setting of a camp that had been created by Donald Bain, a former farmer and hunter. Knowing that many local people were struggling to find food and water, he offered rations of both and brought them together from various places across the Kalahari to an area called Twir Refirin. The patriarch and acknowledged leader of the group in the camp, a man named Clarice, was said to be close to 100 years old. 
Dart gathered the names of the 77 people in the camp, many of whom were Clarice's family, and issued each of them with a cardboard tag and a number. Clarice was tagged as Cal or Kalahari IV. His daughter, Kanako, became Cal V. His granddaughter, Kerry Kerry, was tagged Cal 51. This is Kanako on the far right, and her daughter, Klein Kanako, next to her. The two other women are not named, but they were part of the same community. Dart and his assistant took cranial measurements and measured facial characteristics. They recorded eye color and hair texture and wrote their findings on the cardboard tags. Dart's publication in the Witz journal Bantu Studies in 1937 makes disturbing reading as he gave special attention to the measurements of the external female genitalia. He believed that taking measurements and photographs of intimate body parts would contribute to the effort to confirm racial types. In The Great Long National Insult, Yvette Abrams writes about the sexual obsession that Europeans held with the Khoi and the San as long ago as the 1600s. Dart and his male colleagues brought these anthropological practices into the 20th century. After the measurements were completed, the scientists led each person to a second tent to have their face masks taken. Dart had learned the face mask technique on, the earlier, on an earlier Italian expedition to Somalia, Ethiopia, and the Congo. Lido Cipriani, an Italian um, an Italian physical anthropologist had developed a technique to gather face masks by molding plaster of Paris onto the faces of living people. Cipriani believed in the superiority of Italians and the inferiority of Africans and later worked for the Italian race office. Dart saw this process as a significant new methodology in the field of physical anthropology. Clarice, was the first person to go through the face mask process, lying down on a table in the tent. Clarice's face mask looks eerily like him. After this photo, Clarice took the mask in his hands, looking at it closely. He asserted his control over the situation, walked off with his mask and could not be persuaded to give it back. There were no standard procedures in place in 1936 for seeking a research subject's consent. The Hippocratic Oath was originally written in 400 BC and it was translated into English in the 1700s, but it wasn't adopted by the World Medical Association until 1948. I found out that there was no required procedures in place at the University of the Vipatisrand in 1936, and there were very few established protocols at universities around the world. The ethics of taking these casts and measurements was never questioned by the scientists at the time. Dart and Williams took 70 face masks of nearly all of the adults and some of the children at the camp in Twir Refirin. From then on through to the 1980s, almost every expedition from the Witz Department of Anatomy to study living people across Africa included taking face masks. Today at Witz, there are over a thousand masks in the Raymond Dart collection. While the collection was on display for almost a century, the current curators have taken them down and placed them in storage. After the Witz expedition, Raymond Dart brought members of the same San community, including Clarice and Kanako, to Johannesburg and placed them on display at the Empire exhibition. The Empire exhibition 
celebrated the 50th anniversary of Johannesburg and took place on what is now the Witz West Campus near Empire Road. The Tower of Light, still a notable landmark on campus, was built especially for the exhibition. Speakers at the open air pavilion spoke about the San's physical characteristics and referred to them in demeaning ways. In Bantu studies, Dart wrote, Bushmen are, as it were, living fossils, representative of the primitive state of all mankind, mementos of our primeval past. Dart wasn't the only person using this term living fossil. Jan Smuts, the prime minister of South Africa was supportive of Dart and Robert Broom and also called Khoi and San people living fossils, which is offensive and wrong. Living human beings are not fossils. Dart and Smuts worked together to develop a San reserve similar to the reservations for indigenous people in the United States. The legislation did not pass, but it is one example of how the push for segregation existed in South Africa before apartheid. When Gloris and Kanako and their family returned to the Kalahari, they were evicted off the land. For close to 50 years under apartheid, they were dispersed and their community was destroyed. Thanks to the research of the University of Western Cape professors Siraj Rasool and Patricia Hayes and their 2002 paper, Science and Spectacle, I learned that Kanako's daughter, Carrie Carey's skeleton had become part of the Dart human skeleton collection. As they wrote, it had gone missing. I spent many days in the dark papers in the Witz archive on the fourth floor of Solomon Mishlangu House at Witz, looking for information about Carrie Carey's life. In one of the boxes in the archive, under a pile of letters, I found a very disturbing story about Carrie Carey's death. And I'm gonna read from the book here. I need, need these in this light. On the 9th of September, 1939, Dart received a telegram. Kanako's eldest daughter, perfect specimen, bushwoman, dying, Oatshorn Hospital. If interested, communicate Dr. Nell local. Dr. Nell was the superintendent of the Oatshorn Hospital. Two days later, Dart sent him a telegram. Re Bushwoman, please send information for government authorities concerning name, nature of illness, expectation of life, and possibility of being claimed by relatives. Dr. Nell responded the next day. The information he gave Dart was that the young woman's name was Carrie Carey. She was suffering from septic pneumonia and her prognosis was uncertain. Carrie Carey was barely 20 years old, could hardly breathe and was lying in a hospital far from home. I wish to thank you for your wire concerning the Bushwoman Carrie Carey and her complaint, wrote Dart. He informed Nell that he had secured approval from the Acting Secretary for Education, Mr. Fonsail, for the University of the Witwatersrand to obtain from Oatshorn the body of a female Bushman when it becomes available. The only point about which we are uncertain here, wrote Dart, is whether or not there is any likelihood of the body being claimed by a relative. We have presumed that this was unlikely but calculations in that respect can be easily upset. There is no documentation as to whether Dart informed Kerry Kerry's mother, Tanako, with whom he had previously been in communication. After Dart exchanged telegrams with Dr. Nell in Oatshorn, while Kerry Kerry was still in the hospital with pneumonia, 
Dart asked his chief technician, Eric Williams, to write to Dr. Nell about how to embalm the body. Two days later, on the 16th of September, almost exactly 84 years ago, Dart received the news he had been waiting for. Bushwoman died last night, nearest embalmer available, Port Elizabeth. It was Williams who drove to Oatsworn to retrieve Kerry Kerry's body, and he sent a signed telegram to Dart saying everything, arrived safely, everything okay. He drove back to Johannesburg with Kerry Kerry in the back of his bucky. Within 10 days of the telegram alerting Dart to Kerry Kerry's illness, her body was in the possession of the Department of Anatomy at Witts University. In his effort to understand pure racial types, Dart saw Kerry Kerry's body and her skeleton as a specimen to be studied. There would be no burial for Kerry Kerry. For her family, there would be no closure. For 50 years, her skeleton would remain on a shelf in the Raymond Dart collection of human skeletons. At some point in the 80s or the early 1990s, um, her skeleton was lost. With the help, or it's not clear if it was stolen or misplaced. One theory is that it was taken out for teaching purposes and never returned. With the help of Brendan Billings and Tobias Holton at the School of Anatomical Sciences, I spent years searching, but her skeleton has never been found. In many ways, Harry Carey's story is reminiscent of Sarah Barton. As an enslaved coy woman, Bartman, like Carrie Carey, was pulled away from her home and family to be placed on show at an exhibition and to be studied by scientists. Both women died young. The French anatomist George Cuvier made a body cast of Bartman that was on display at the Musée de l'Homme in Paris until 1974. Carrie Carey's cast stood on display at Witz for over six decades until the early 2000s when it was put away in storage. Philip Tobias was Raymond Dart's student in the 1940s and 50s, and he took over from Dart as the head of the Department of Anatomy at Witts Medical School in 1959. Like Dart with the young with the Taung child skull, Tobias is also widely known for his work in paleoanthropology. He worked for years in East Africa with the Leakies describing Homo habilis. Here he is with Mary Leakey. Also, Tobias is known for reopening the Sterkfontein Caves outside Johannesburg and for contributing to the growing ancient fossil collection at Witz, which in, two, in 2014 moved from anatomy here over to the Evolutionary Studies Institute on the main campus. In many ways, Tobias differed from Dart. As a young Jewish student, he was deeply affected by World War II. Hitler's Holocaust raised scientific questions for him about race. In 1948, he was elected the president of the National Union of South African Students, NUSAS. And he was supportive of Witts University remaining open to black students as the government imposed apartheid. Some of you knew Philip Tobias. Some of you worked with him. He embodied many contradictions. As Dart's protege, Tobias fully embraced race typology. 15 years after Dart's expedition in 1951, 
Tobias made his first of many trips to the Kalahari to study the sun. Each of these trips involved measuring every part of a person's anatomy, as Dart did, including women's labia. In 1953, writing a journal article about race, Tobias condemned the invalid interpretation of race purity by the Nazis. But he said the scientific reaction might have led the pendulum to swing almost too far in the opposite direction. We find today a tendency to deny the validity of the race concept for anthropology. A steadying of the pendulum is required. In 1955, Tobias traveled to Paris to study fossils. While he was there, he saw Sarah Bartman's remains. Little did he know that 40 years later, he would be involved in the efforts to return her remains to South Africa. Tobias took over from Dart as the head of the Department of Anatomy in 1959. In over 35 years as head of the department, he continued to take face masks at each expedition across Southern Africa. And he added 2,000 human skeletons to the Dart collection well into the 1980s. This is Tobias at an exhibit called Man in Africa at the Johannesburg City Hall in 1963, where he's using the face masks uh, to explain to a school group about the different racial types across the continent. The paradox of Tobias's opposition to apartheid on the one hand and his scientific practices on the other came through when he led another expedition, this time to Campbell in the Northern Cape. In 1961, Tobias exhumed the skeletons of Cornelius Koch II, who had died 103 years earlier in 1858. Tobias exhumed the remains of several other family members as well. Tobias wanted to collect other types of skeletons for the Dart collection. Scientific researchers did not include contextual information and biographies, but simply labeled them Griqua skeletons. According to a local newspaper article at the time, upon seeing a member of the Griqua community at the exhumation, the 70-year-old Niels Vattermont, Tobias described him as a wonderful link with the primitive. By this time, apartheid laws were in full swing. The Population Registration Act initially classified Griqua people as African. They had to carry a reference book and pay a poll tax. If a person did not mention to a government official that they were Griqua, but instead said that they were colored, they would be exempt from the tax. So by the 1960s, most people who had previously described themselves as Griqua, were classified as colored. Tobias told the Koch family and the, and the local newspaper reported that it would be two years before experiments and investigations could be completed and Cornelius Koch's remains would be returned. However, the skeletons remained at Witz for decades. One of Tobias's students, a Canadian PhD student named Alan Morris, chose to focus on the Requa skeletons in 1977 and completed his PhD in 1984. Morris is now Professor Emeritus at the Department of Human Biology at the University of Cape Town. It was only after the end of apartheid that the Koch family approached Tobias 35 years after the skeletons were taken, saying they wanted their ancestors' remains back. The return ceremony at Witz was in 1996. You can see Adam Koch V in the center and Tobias on the left. It took another nine years of negotiations and the remains were only reburied in Campbell in 2007. 
This is a story of institutional power and science and race. Back in 1962, another South African physical anthropologist, Ronald Singer, spoke about grave digging, which he said scientists fondly called excavating. After that initial trip to Campbell, Tobias led three further trips with students in 1963, 67, and 71 for excavations. His trips interested other Witz professors, including Hertha de Villiers and Trevor Jenkins. It's hard to believe that all three professors took measurements of women's labia in Campbell, which contributed to journal articles well into the 1960s. Sorry. This is a young Hertha de Villiers, a student of darts who became a professor and was a colleague with Tobias. Here's a later photo of Tobias, de Villiers and Dart with Alan Hughes on the left. Tobias's public profile in relation to race resulted in an increasing number of visitors to the Department of Anatomy asking for assistance with racial classification. On one occasion in 1966, Tobias responded to a request from the Princess Alice Adoption Home. A nurse came into Tobias's office with a baby girl. They needed to help to classify the baby's race before they could place her for adoption. This was not new as Dart in the 1920s had served as a witness in two court cases to establish the race of the accused. The nurse told Tobias that the baby had an Australian mother and that the father's name was Amamu. There is reason to be suspicious, said Tobias. After a long period of examining the baby, the baby's hair, facial features, and head shape, he declared that he could not confirm that the baby was white. On a second visit with the baby, Tobias called his colleague Herta de Villiers into his office to assist with the examination. There might be some Aboriginal features here, said Tobias. As a result, the nurse was thinking that the baby would be sent to a colored orphanage. At that moment, the phone rang and Tobias took an international call. You handle this, he said to de Villiers. When de Villiers said, she's a beautiful child, the nurse urged de Villiers to adopt her. That's absurd, said de Villiers, but in the end, she did. Decades later, it became clear that the baby had an Australian mother and her father was Samuel Amamu from Ghana. I'd like to acknowledge that that baby, Philippa Ya de Villiers, accomplished poet, lecturer at Wits in creative writing, author, playwright, and performer is here with us tonight. Mm. In 1978, Tobias wrote a book that brought together his work in the Kalahari entitled The Bushman. In his chapter entitled The San, An Evolutionary Perspective, Tobias wrote, in general, it would not be accurate to speak of them as living fossils since most of them do not represent the survival of an otherwise extinct kind of man. It was preposterous that Tobias used this term that Dart, Broom, and Smuts had used 50 years earlier. Tobias closed the chapter by saying, we may regard the San as being living fossils, not only in their hunter-gatherer ways, 
of life, but perhaps even in their biological heritage. You might ask, how does all of this relate to Steve Biko? Well, let's now turn to Steve Biko and how his life and death opened the way to address medical ethics. In 1966, Steve Biko began studying medicine at the University of Natal. At a young age, he understood colonial thinking, racism, and white supremacy, and he knew how destructive they were. In I Write What I Like, he wrote, the most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. His contributions to philosophy and black consciousness movement pushed back against the overwhelming influence of colonial and racist thinking. On September 12th, 1977, exactly 46 years ago today, Steve Biko died in detention. He was murdered. Two days earlier, healthy and 30 years old, he had been arrested in Port Elizabeth. In prison, the security police beat him badly. And this is where the medical profession was implicated. Dr. Ivor Lang recorded that he found nothing wrong with Biko. Dr. Benjamin Tucker examined him and recommended that Biko be taken to the hospital. But after the secu security police argued with him, he changed his mind and said it wasn't necessary. Security police drove Biko over 700 kilometers to Pretoria. Biko made the trip naked in the back of a van where he was injured further, reminiscent of Kerry Carey's body making the trip in the, back of the in the back of a bucky from Oatshorn to Johannesburg. Biko died the next night alone in hospital. It was the South African Medical and Dental Council's role to protect patients from improper medical conduct. They did not hold the doctors to account and they attempted a cover-up. This single death in detention amongst many under apartheid led to an outcry and prompted many efforts related to human rights, medicine, and health. Professor Joe Variava, who is now Professor Emeritus at WITS, was one of the people to raise the alarm. Submissions to the council were ignored, but Variava persisted. He was joined by other doctors, including Tim Wilson and Dumisani Mzamane. Tobias, who was Dean of Medicine at the time, joined as well as Francis Ames and Trevor Jenkins, who you can see in this photo. The group took their case to the Pretoria Supreme Court, Variava and others versus the South African Medical and Dental Council. To their surprise, on the 30th of January, 1985, the judgment ordered the council to hold a formal disciplinary hearing for the two doctors involved and to pay the costs for the case. Doctors Lang and Tucker were found guilty. Lang received only a caution and continued to practice for five more years until he retired. Tucker was struck off the roll, but he issued a public apology and successfully applied to be reinstated. During this process, doctors at UCT and WITS saw the need to establish local medical ethics committees that would have status in the faculty and offer advice to doctors. Trevor Jenkins was involved in creating course material about medical ethics. Variava again played a role in 1997 when the Witz Faculty of Health Science was asked to make a submission to special hearings on the health sector in front of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Max Price, the Dean, Trevor Jenkins and Variava put together the material. In his submission, Price said, 
we look specifically at the failure of the faculty to address human rights and ethics as a substantive and formal component of the curriculum prior to 1984. Price shared that in preparation for the TRC submission, many white staff members believed that Vitz had offered a liberal environment and an oasis of freedom for black staff and students during apartheid. However, in interviews, this proved untrue. Many black staff and students felt angry and bitter because they experienced exclusion, humiliation, and hurt by discriminatory practices. As a result, Vitz decided to conduct an internal reconciliation commission, an IRC. If you don't look at everything from the past, they declared, the legacy will continue. Most of the submissions to the IRC related to the discrimination against black students in the 1960s and 70s under apartheid. For example, Variava remembers clearly that black students were not allowed in postmortems of what if white bodies were being examined. The IRC did not review the history of the DART human skeleton collection or the DART face mask collection. There was no review of anthropological practices at Witts Medical School and the Department of Anatomy from the 1920s to the 1980s. No review of the trips to the Kalahari and other parts of the country and the continent. The IRC focused on the impact of apartheid. It did not look more deeply at the influence of colonial thinking, white supremacy, and the hierarchy of race that had embedded even prior to the establishment of apartheid in 1948. Scientific racism was not only in people's minds, but also in the bodily remains in the basement of the building. Earlier this year, reflecting on the IRC, Professor Emeritus Joe Variava said, because the IRC did not review the faculty's earlier pre-apartheid history, the process was incomplete. Nevertheless, the IRC was an important process. The Faculty of Health Sciences placed a statue and a plaque at the entrance of Witz Medical School. You can take a look as you leave the talk tonight. The plaque reads, the Faculty of Health Sciences, University of the Witwatersrand, Johannesburg, commits itself to the ideals of non-discrimination in its teaching, the constitution of its student body, the selection and promotion of staff, and in its administration. It reaffirms its rejection of racism and other violations of human rights in whatever form they make their challenge. In committing itself to these ideals, the faculty acknowledges that these values have not been honored and it apologizes for the hurt and suffering caused to students, staff, and patients by past racial and other discriminatory practices. The faculty recognizes the respect that staff and students have in preserving these ideals and pays tribute to the efforts of those who strove to bring about change for the benefit of future generations, 2nd of February, 2000. 30 years after Steve Biko's death, in 2007, Professor Ames Dye became the founder director of the Steve Biko Center for Bioethics at Witz. Professor Joe Variava served as board chair from its founding until his retirement. Sorry. No South African physical anthropologist was involved in providing the scientific underpinning for the government's race classification practices, wrote Tobias in 1985, when he was 60 years old. Tobias was correct in the strict sense that no physical anthropologist submitted proposals to the government, wrote Tobias's student, Alan Morris, 
nor did they join in the legislative or administrative process. But Morris goes on to say that they were involved because they provided a fertile growth medium in which the apartheid ideology could flourish. The work of physical anthropologists did mirror the efforts of government racial classification. They were active at other universities and museums around the country, including the University of Cape Town and the University of Pretoria. At Stellenbosch, physical anthropologists worked hard to distinguish the physical characteristics between white Afrikaners and people classified as colored. But by the late 1980s, apartheid was under threat. At the same time, the scientific understanding of race and the theories of human evolution were changing. The field of genetics was proposing new ideas about human origins. This is Himla Sudyal, who studied human genetics at Witts in the 1980s with Trevor Jenkins, and who later worked with mitochondrial DNA that is passed down only on the maternal side the maternal line. In 1987, three researchers from the US published their research in Nature entitled Mitochondrial DNA and Human Evolution. The impact was dramatic. For years, there had been different interpretations of the fossil record. What the research showed was that all human beings on earth shared a common ancestor around 200,000 years ago in Africa. Newsweek magazine picked up on the implication of the research and painted and printed their famous cover story in 1988. The new science had made its way into the popular press and was starting to shape public opinion. Once again, there was a negative reaction to the theory that humans had origins in Africa. It happened with Darwin. It happened with Dart and the town child skull. And it happened again in the 1980s and 90s with mitochondrial DNA. Just as the search for human origins was shifting, so too was the political environment in South Africa post-apartheid. Given his senior position at WITS, Tobias was asked by the South African government in 1996 to serve on a reference committee on the return of Sarah Bartman's remains. As a result, Tobias was part of a lengthy and heated debate about whether a sample of Sarah Bartman's remains, once they were returned to South Africa, should be retained for further DNA testing that would allow for scientific analysis. But Dr. Yvette Abrams, who had conducted many years of research and written her PhD about Bartman, also served on the reference committee. Abrams, who is now the acting director of the Coy and San Center at UCT, took the opposite view. Using Bartman's body for scientific research, she said, was wrong. Because, she said, it is exactly what we have spent the last decade saying was wrong for the French. Initially, Himla Sudyal, who also served on the committee, agreed with Tobias wanting to prove that Sarah Bartman's soft tissue belonged to the same person as her skeleton. But after listening to the debates, Sudyal agreed and said, healing is going to be a better antidote than the proof of evidence-based science. While Tobias had reached out to his scientific colleagues in France about the return of Sarah Bartman's remains, for many years, the French said no. It was the powerful poem by South African poet, Diana Ferris, entitled, I've Come to Take You Home, that finally convinced the French. The poem was entered into legislation and the French government finally agreed. Her poem shaped history and in 2002, Sarah Bartman's remains were welcomed back to South Africa. <laughs> 
Tobias to continue to argue that it was a trifle naive to think that the two, three, or at most four English-speaking physical anthropologists in South Africa helped create the climate or public opinion of apartheid. He continued to stand by his view that they had not provided Milan or Fafut or Stratum with the scientific underpinnings of their philosophy. In my view, Tobias never reconciled his opposition to apartheid with his anthropological practices. Tobias had the opportunity to work with the new post-apartheid government and reshape his reputation. But just as he wanted to reinvent himself, he wanted to protect Dart's legacy as well. To the end of his life in 2012, Tobias continued to be loyal to Dart and he downplayed the racism implicit in race typology, which he himself had earlier embraced. Despite his prolific writing throughout his life, he never wrote or spoke openly about Kiri Kiri. The story of Kuris and Kanako and Kiri Kiri continued into the post-apartheid era their extended family and their descendants brought a legal land claim forward in South Africa, which they won in 1999. Some of their descendants, including Oma Una Roy and others, helped to save their indigenous language, Mu. The Kumani San have a proud heritage and ancestry. In 2017, the South African San Institute developed an excellent San code of research ethics. It covers issues of respect, honesty, justice, and fairness. In 2002, the South African Broadcasting Corporation aired a documentary called Tobias's Bodies. We are all African, said Tobias to the camera. Over and over again, Tobias made the point that we are all members of the same species, homo sapiens, which was an important message. You might recognize a few people in this photo. The lifting of apartheid provided an environment in which Tobias felt more comfortable embracing this new narrative of human origins. But in 1996, Saul Debeau published Scientific Racism in Modern South Africa. In 2000, Siraj Rasool and Martin Legasik published Skeletons in the Cupboard. For the first time, they chronicled the skeleton trade in South Africa at the turn of the 20th century and described in detail how human remains were collected unethically by numerous museums and university collections. And so began the slow process of working toward a national policy on human remains. For over 20 years, requests for reburial of remains have been dealt with on an ad hoc basis. Descendant communities and advocates, including Iziko Museum in Cape Town and others, have been pushing for government to develop a national policy on human remains that can guide all curators, museums, and universities. Finally, in March 2021, the draft policy on repatriation and restitution of human remains was ratified by Parliament. The new legislation allows for the establishment of a national advisory committee and a dedicated office in the South African Heritage Resources Agency, SARA, overseen by the Department of Sports, Arts and Culture. This history is not over. The history of physical anthropology, anatomy, and paleoanthropology 
shines a light on the need for a reckoning with the past. While some have argued that all collections of human remains should be reburied, the new national legislation says that they can be used for ethical research and educational purposes. But exactly how will that be implemented? There are two curators of the DART collections at the Witz School of Anatomical Sciences today, Brandon Billings and Anya Mayer. They have inherited these collections just as curators of collections throughout the country and across the world. Over the past several years, they have implemented new internal policies and created ethics committees to oversee the collections. But these issues are not theirs alone. This reckoning is part of a broader faculty. It is institutional and it's ours as a society. On its website, Witz says, for good is our reason for being. It is why we seek to create new knowledge. Last year, Witz celebrated its 100th birthday. In 2025, we will mark the centenary of Raymond Dart having described the Taung child skull in nature. It is time for us to reflect on what has changed in that century. This is a great opportunity for all of us. Earlier, I said that the medical field and paleoanthropology is built on a foundation of racist science. So today in 2023, as we reflect on bioethics, we must be aware of these layers and this racist foundation. Only with that awareness and knowledge will doctors and medical professionals, geneticists, archeologists, anthropologists, be able to build a more complete understanding of ethics that embraces everyone. Only then, will we be able to build a new generation of anatomists, anthropologists, and scholars? Drawing on Diana Ferris's poem, I've Come to Take You Home, we can gain a sense of how to humanize not only Sarah Bartman, but also Carrie Carey, and all those ancestral remains in need of rest. I have come to take you home where the ancient mountains shout your name. I have made your bed at the foot of the hill. Your blankets are covered in buhu and mint. The proteus stand in yellow and white. I have come to take you home where I will sing for you for you have brought me peace, for you have brought us peace. Thank you. I mean, it's really difficult to to summarize, not even to try to summarize, just to express the emotions that one feels. And I think in everyone in this audience and the 350 people that are online would agree. I'm not too sure what's the best description of what you've just taken us through. It's really an emotional journey. Is it depressing? It is depressing. Is it disturbing? Extremely disturbing. Is it damning? It's damning. It's an indictment of the type of science that took place at this institution. It's saddening that the likes of Raymond Dodd that are highly regarded, that was the longest serving dean in this faculty, 
or from 1925 to 1943. We can only imagine the other type of research that also took place during that time in this faculty, which has not been documented, which has infringed on the rights of indigenous Africans. So as you were speaking, I received a few messages and I think the message, I'll read out one of those messages, um, which really speaks to what you just mentioned in terms of has the time arrived for us to really internalize what has transpired at this university in this faculty. Now read this message directly. Christa's lecture, Christa's lecture is some disturbing historical content. The faculty held the IRC in the mid 1990s but what about the commission of inquiry into the scientific atrocities of the last hundred years? Some kind of acknowledgement of the faculty's role in perpetuating a party ideology through science. I think you've opened a closet and the skeletons have tumbled out. And I don't say that lightly. It is really, really sad in what's happened. So Krista, thanks for having made the time. And it was really an eye opener. I think uh, I had the privilege of having read this uh, book uh, and I thought I'd internalized it then, uh, but only to realize that I really didn't internalize it sufficiently and a really moving talk. So at this stage, I would like to call upon Prof. Amis Dias to respond to the talk. Uh, as you've heard, Prof. Amis Dias is a founder and past director of the Steve Zico Center for bioethics and visiting professor at Edwards School of Medicine. She's a leading authority in bioethics, both internationally and locally, and can be credited with entrenching bioethics and human rights as an integral aspect of health sciences in South Africa. Using an academic platform, Prof. Dai has taken a lead in health advocacy and activism. She has published extensively in this field. And I think Prof. Dai is going to be joining us virtually. Thank you. Good evening and thank you so much. I hope you can hear me. Um, as Krista was presenting and as I had and, and while I read her book, I asked myself, how do I actually respond to the book? Um, it's an absolutely insightful read. As I read the book, I felt an intense disappointment at Wits for what I would say its heinous past acts. And also because this book was published in 2016 and I have not seen movement at Wits hierarchy to address the issues raised. So what are we doing today? We're drawing from history to locate the patterns that emerged as a result of scientific racism. History can do much to enrich the understanding of how, why, and under what circumstances issues in ethics come to the fore and achieve national and even na international prominence, as well as how some issues fade away only to surface again and be rediscovered by later observers, as has been the case in Darwin's hunch. That science has been molded in a social and political context with biological determinants, determinism being central through the 18th and 19th century is really without question. Hierarchy amongst humans was promoted in Europe and the West, with Europeans being superior to other people around the world. The new science of anthropology underscored hierarchy and superiority. Europeans were civilized. Societies outside Europe were less evolved and hence less civilized. And this took me back to my PhD on vulnerability in health research, where I found that the first studies of, of experimentation on humans took place on slaves and the poor. And this actually did coincide with the development of this new science of anthropology, which Europeans used to study non-European peoples. Generally speaking, human experimentation was initially undertaken on those who were considered to be uncivilized, 
and often less than human with diminished or no moral status. Even colonial and imperial rule was often justified by anthropological research, which described the native peoples of Africa, the Americas, and Asia as being of in inferior intelligence and ability, and hence in need of paternalistic rule by European powers or immigrants. And their anthropological findings were based definitely on the category of race. In South Africa, arguments that racial difference result in differing levels of intelligence was used by the state to prevent social change being called and fought for by the oppressed. And these arguments were in the main based on the science that was emanating from our leading institutions in the country and outside. I'll just say a few words on Witz's role. And while there were several scientists that fed the colonial and apartheid racism policies through their professional and academic work, I'll focus on the two individuals that Krista has described in detail, and that's Robert Dart and to, uh, Philip Tobias. Robert Dart's work was backed by Jan Smuts. He had a close relationship with Jan Smuts. And I'm going to quote what I saw in the book. And this was a quote from Jan Smuts. Our Bushmen are nothing but living fossils whose contemporaries disappeared from Europe many thousands of years ago. Smuts used this scientific research as a means to confirm his political point of view. And Dart clearly supported this notion of the living fossils. And the scientific racism from the laboratories at Witz was also used by the courts. For example, Dart gave expert evidence in court using skin color charts to testify whether people arrested in line with racial policy policies were white or colored. And we've heard from Krista how Philippa de Villiers uh, was classified by, um, uh, by Tobias as being colored, but before that classification could actually be um, uh, penned down, she was adopted by uh, Hertha de Villiers, who was uh, a researcher with Tobias at that time. And so I would say this, this thinking at that time by the scientists, generally, globally, but also those from Witz paved the way for the arguments to back white supremacy and support segregation policies and the social engineering that resulted. We've heard about the face masks. Now, this was an aggressive technique. And we read in the book that people were lied to, that it had healing properties. And we saw this happening right through to the 80s uh, at Wits during its expeditions. And we also heard that they are about, or they are actually, 1110 face masks in the Dart collection. We've heard about the Kalahari expeditions. And we've heard about how people living in the Kalahari were exploited because of their state of poverty. They were struggling to get food and water. And they were drawn, they were induced into the research done by Witz researchers and their vulnerability exploited. We've also heard about how uh, these vulnerable subjects were transported to be exhibits at the ex Empire Exhibition, where they were depicted as the savage past as compared to modern day civilized present. 
And one of the objectives of this exhibition was to justify the need to establish reserves for these Bushmen and thereby support racial segregation. And in fact, when these Bushmen or so-called Bushmen returned to their homes in the Northern Cape, they had already been evicted from there, just like the others in the community. And they ended up living in townships and on outskirts. We've heard the sad story of Kerry Kerry. And we look at, you know, we, we, we ask the question of how Dr. Nell and Dr. Dart and, and Professor Dart, who was medically trained, how did they view their medical ethics? The most important thing at, around the time of Keri Keri's dying was the fact that she would be a perfect specimen for the BITS team and for Dart's quest to find that missing link in human evolution. At no stage do we see recorded that Keri Keri was actually a human being with feelings, with parents, with siblings, with relatives. She died alone on the 15th of September, 1939. Her body was loaded onto a bucky and driven to bits. On the 11th of September, after suffering severe brain damage during interrogation, Steve Biko was loaded onto a bucky, naked and shackled, and driven 700 kilometers to Pretoria. He also died alone in a cell on the 12th September, 1977. Kerry Kerry's doctors, just like the doctors who examined Biko, I would say colluded with the state. And it was not only Kerry Kerry's doctors, but I would say Kerry Kerry's doctors joined together with the Witt scientists, who were also many of them doctors, to take forward that propagation of racism in medicine and science. And interestingly enough, as we proceed through the book, years later, we see recorded that in 2004, Philip Tobias stated that Kerry Kerry had died on the way to the Empire exhibition and explained that as the reason for her remains ending up at this. Now, much has also been said about Tobias, and it's extremely disappointing because I too viewed him as an icon. The fact that he was reluctant to give up the concept of typology and its implications. And the fact that while he had taken a stand against apartheid in the early 60s, his writings and lectures were very different and showed that he was really not ready to reject the relevance of racial classification. We know that he was also involved in uh, uh, the grave digging um, at the, you know, uh, in Campbell. And what is so sad is when Witz did convene a repatriation event at the university, it did not provide for the transport of the skeletons to Campbell for reburial. But stated that the skeletons were returned in Johannesburg and transport and reburial was not its responsibility. I hope in our quest for redress, we do not repeat this, this, this um, irresponsible way of handling skeletons as we move into the future. There were only seven skeletons that were finally reburied. It would seem as if 28 more skeletons from this collection still remain at Witz. So, Tobias's work was definitely in contradiction to his public stance on respecting human rights. And he never apologized, but he always wrote defensively. And just like Dart, his scientific output also provided that fodder, 
for apartheid ideology to flourish. So while there are claims that Dart and Tobias did not contribute actively towards the policies of the day, they may not have contributed overtly, but they definitely did this covertly. This book raises several issues. It includes the unethical approach to scientific research, scientific misconduct, and the role scientists played, both overt and covert, in furthering human rights abuses and colluding with the harsh policies that entrenched those abuses. The question now is, what should the university do towards redemption for its sins of the past? And how should it go about doing this? I think it should be a, now in, in this quest for redress. We don't have any knowledge of how much the university did to actually locate Keri Keri skeleton. I think this needs to be pursued as well. We also need to consider what should be done not only with the skeletons, but that collection of masks that were obtained in deceitful, misleading and inhumane ways. And I'm sure there's body casts in storage as well. And I think it's not enough just to leave them in storage. Last but not least, we need to actually think seriously about the fact that the university has a building named after Philip Tobias. And with what Krista has just exposed in her book, should Tobias's misdeeds be so rewarded? As we confront these challenges, let's remember what Steve Biko had said. In time, we shall be in a position to bestow upon South Africa the greatest possible gift, a more human face. Perhaps it's time for Witz to take forward Steve's quest, starting with the anatomy lab and taking this further afield and even outside Witz. Yes, it is time to reflect, but we need to go beyond reflection. And with that, I thank you. Over. Uh, thanks, Prof. Dai. So I'm going to hand over to the chairperson. <laughs> Thank you to uh, Prof. Dai, as well as to Krista and our Dean. Um, yeah, I, I think um, time, just checking on time and um, Anybody has any kinds of questions or comments they just want to make from, from in here? I'll come to everyone online shortly. Thanks. So in second year, when we were doing anatomy, we had skulls that we could take home. But yes, and I wonder where those skulls come from, but it was for the study of the human cranium. And what was creepy was that in the corridor towards the anatomy lab, there were the exhibitions of the masks there, but I know that they took them down now. So that, that's crazy. And I have something else and I mean no disrespect to anyone who's in the audience, particularly Ms. De Villiers, but Heather De Villiers, her thesis was a biomedical and morphological study of the skull of the South African Bantu speaking Negro. That was the title of her thesis. Now, in Jean Pourriot speaks about fatal strategies, in fatal strategies about when you want to change you must do systematic sabotage. And Fanon speaks that the colonization was an inherently violent process. It, 
in so decolonization will also be an inherently violent process. So situations like this help us to ponder, how are we going to decolonize without compromising the academic project? Yeah, thank you. Just to add on what he has just said, because in the presentation, particularly on the part of uh, Steve Biko, mm. and uh, taking into cognizance that the presentation was about a lecture on Biko, my assumption was that having mentioned all the historical issues that impacted on the mind of uh, people, and also having indicated that Biko indicated that the most important weapon in the hand of the oppressor is the mind of the person. Now, I think what is critical, because I can sense it, that we also have students here who may say, right, we've heard what we have said, so what? I think that's the point, so what should we do? We know it now, so what? But I think what is critical now is say the paradigm shift, because if some of the students are going to write, this is here, yeah, the paradigm shift, so to say, what is the framework that you can use to inform our conceptual and theoretical framework. So I was expecting that maybe in the presentation you say now, can we use black conscious? Because people spoke broadly about the, each of the, the philosophy of black consciousness. How can you use black consciousness as a philosophy to inform our conceptual framework as well as our theoretical framework? Perhaps, Raj, we can just uh, get uh, uh, Krista to comment unless it's uh, similar just to yeah maybe just comment on on, on yeah. this right now mm -hmm. I think just there to see that Lindsay also asks around can you please comment on what you you view as the durability of colonialist ideology and its influence upon the practice of biological paleontology so you can just sort of talk to it all together I suppose <laughs> right Thank you for the, the question um, from you, a student, about how to decolonize. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention is that Witz is not alone in this. This is an issue that museums and institutions and universities are dealing with across South Africa, across the UK, Europe, and the United States. If any of you have read uh, articles re recently about the Smithsonian Institution in the US and what Alex Herdlicke was doing as a physical anthropologist in the early part of the 20th century, it's quite shocking. And they are facing that now. Um, I, I brought a quote about, you know, Harvard University has great collections of human remains. And they, in 2021, so not 30 years ago, in 2021, they embarked on a review of those collections. And Lawrence Bacow, the president at the time said, we must begin to confront the reality of a past in which academic curiosity and opportunity overwhelmed humanity. So there are other, um, there are other places to look at what is happening. And so Vitz can join in an effort that is underway and that many people have devoted their careers to working for change. So you are not starting from scratch. Um, when you say, so what? So what is next is the next question. And I think, Prof. Dai pointed to some of that. And I think that that a process that would allow a full assessment, a full accounting of everything in the Adler Museum, everything in the School of Anatomical Sciences, um, you know, to have a sense of what is there in full and then to go through a process of uh, accounting and, and also to review history in full. I think that would be a very powerful process to enter into um, as a faculty, as a university, 
and it could be very powerful um, in, in the message that it sends to students um, and to faculty and to everyone. Um, the question online was a big one. It was about how is colonial, uh, how are con colonial influences uh, still there in 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 um, in science in paleoanthropology? This is an issue that I deal with extensively in Darwin's Hunch. Right? Can you comment on the durability of colonialist colonialist ideology? Um, especially, especially in paleoanthropology. And that that is the topic of Darwin's hunch, in fact. So I encourage you, if you're interested in that particular question, um, do, do read and um, we can talk more. <laughs> I'll, I'll say it by the book. <laughs> um, and I, I must say it is still with us. It is still with us um, in, um, in terms of the structure of the field, um, efforts to try to, to shift that, to, um, to create a new generation of young students coming into the, into the field um, and, and, and looking in new ways and making sure that South African students, African students are a part of this field. And it's not only you know, researchers from the US, from the UK, from Europe to arrive, do their research and then leave with the data. That is a colonial way of doing research. And that is often the way it is still done today. And so the need to encourage, uh, you know, the involvement of local, local researchers um, who are leading the way. And I, I really want to do a, a, a shout out to Kim Tommy, who is the new CEO of PAST and is, is uh, helping to, to lead the way in doing this important work. Thanks. Um... Uh, there is a hand over there and over there. I'm just not sure. So maybe we could just take these three and, and then I'll check online for, for any more questions. Thank you, Krista. Really appreciate your talk. Hi. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just want to clarify a few uh, things. So first of all, the Campbell collection or the Campbell individuals. Now, Prof Dai mentioned that only seven of them have been reburied. That is incorrect. They, um, there were only seven who were actually, um, who we know who they were. They had names and surnames. All the other individuals were not identified. However, every single one of these individuals were reburied during the reburial ceremony. It's just a misunderstanding because only seven of them were named. Secondly, um, I want to point out, yes, I think it is extremely important that we discuss what has happened in the past. We should not hide away from it. We shouldn't try and put it away in storage, as has been mentioned here. Now, I want to point out the face masks. Even though the majority of them have been taken away from public view, we still have a small collection in our museum. The reason why we decided to keep this small collection is to highlight what has happened in the past. Not to celebrate it, but to highlight these atrocities and own up to it. And I think that is a very important component of going forwards. I think as the new generation of students come up, we need to try and yes, understand what happened in the past and bring that to light, but also come up with new ways of addressing these things and make sure that we don't go back and make the same mistakes. I do think, yes, Prof Dai mentioned that maybe we can start with the School of Anatomical Sciences, definitely. I do, however, think that between you know several individuals, and throughout many years, there has been so much that we have done 
and very little attention has been given to what has actually changed. And I think that would be a narrative that we need to take forward, start off by saying, this is what happened in the past. These are the things that were wrong. This is how we are addressing it currently. And this is where we want to go forwards. And in that, incorporate the new generation, the new students, and get their voices. How do they want to take this forward? How do they want to make, um, yeah. Change. Change, basically, yeah. Mm. Thank you so much. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Anya. Really appreciate your input and comment. And um, yeah, I... I I agree that in um, in moving forward into the future, you you want to remember the past. Yeah. Just a question about institutional enablement and institutional accountability, because I mean, uh, Vids created the environment, the platform, and the support for these things to carry on. How does the institution account and how can it assure the public that it will ensure that this doesn't happen again? Because this type of work will happen in other areas. And are you going to wait when there's a whistleblower for the university to take action? And, and we can't let the institutions go off scot-free because they are the enablers. And they need to come up with a roadmap of how they're going to show, ensure that as an institution, it's not just this incident that we look at, that they have a way of ensuring this type of thing will never happen again in this institution. I'm not sure I'm the person to answer that question. Um. <laughs> I, I I would I would think that that the process of how an institution is held to account, um, or that uh, that a, a process moving forward is something that that Vitz is going to have to think through, that the faculty is going to have to think through. Um, but uh, I think it's an important it it would be very important for it to happen. Thank you so much for the opportunity to make a comment. I know many people are too actually upset to speak. The first time that I'm aware of in the South Africa that this book was launched, Krista, was at the University of Pretoria after a very big fight when I was working there to get an exhibition on the history of racism in medicine with the focus on your period all the way up to the time of Vota Basson. And the pushback from some people in the university was vicious, as you know, even though the Dean of Health Sciences, Yanni Hugo, and Eric Book supported us. And the first university that I'm aware of in the country to set your book was the course that I taught at UP. But it was shut down after one year, including other work we taught. We're working to bring a big conference to WITS next year on the history of racism in medicine in September 2024. And we have instituted it with, with the support of the Dean and many of our colleagues in the Center for Health Science Education. And I would like to also single out Professor Haroon Saluji. We're instituting a, a brand new course that will be picked up with the MBBCH the beginning of next year. Dr. Carol Hartman and many other people are involved from the faculty. Your book is one of the core texts in the history and science of philosophy and medicine in South Africa. It's the first time in any South African university that the history of medicine and science will be required for the MBBCH. We have incubated this course for three years in the Department of Family Medicine and Primary Care for health system science students. And I'd also like to recognize the BCMP degree which has allowed us the space to work with clinicians. For the first time in any South African university, 
um, a whole major in medical and health humanities for BSc students was inaugurated this year. And the last seven weeks begin on Monday on human rights. Again, Krista's book and others will be taught. I hope that Vitz does not lose the courage to keep doing this, along with all the other suggestions colleagues have made, but this will take resources and Vitz will have to put some money to this because if this is done at, as it's being done at the moment with small amounts of funds and with people working over and above their work, we won't get very far. Vitz will have to commit resources to this. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you so much, Kath Burns. You've been working on this for many years. And I agree completely that resources need to be brought to bear to the questions that have been asked. And I know that the Steve Biko Center for Bioethics can be, can be an important uh, role player in this. In a conversation I had with Brendan Billings, he said, would the center be supportive of a process you know, be supportive of us moving forward, addressing um, ethics um, in in our work and in, in reviewing the history. Um, so I I I think that um, that that's important. And 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 also just want to perhaps close with the fact that um, when you look back into history, we have to hold everything at the same time. Anya's point makes me think that, for example, in the United States, George Washington has been an icon for generations. People, you know, applaud him, look up to him as the first president of the United States. George Washington was a slave owner. And history and discussion of history needs to be revisited in order to incorporate these aspects of one person's life. And we're going to have to do that again. We have to have a sense of important contributions made and unethical actions taken by the same person. Uh, I, I think it's a very important project, and I will um, want to be supportive of what I hope is the beginning of a very important journey. Vits for good. Thank you very much, colleagues. Unfortunately, we've run uh, a bit over time, but but I'm sure you all appreciate even having gone over time. It was a a very riveting. Um, I think the dean has has, has given all the, the 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 descriptive words to to ex to describe tonight's presentation. Um, I certainly am looking forward to to getting your book and and reading it. And, and certainly at, at the center, we are always have an open door policy to looking at how we can also make a contribution. I'm not sure where Kevin is right now, but um, you're more than welcome. He's probably hiding somewhere at the back there. Um, but but if Brandon is around, you can can grab him out um, somewhere at the back there and, and, and chat to him a bit more about how we as the center can also support these kinds of initiatives. Having said that, I'd like to again, Thank Krista. Really, we, we truly appreciate this. this is a very important topic, long overdue. And I think lots of people do have these conversations in, in, in various spaces. Um, so thank you very much for, for that. Also to Prof. Ames Dye, um, former head of the center, as you've all heard, as well as to the dean and to all of you here in attendance tonight and all close to 300 um, attending online. Thank you very much. Also, we look forward to hosting you at our next sessions like this. Thank you. Good night. No. Just give me a moment. Just